Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We'll just wait a couple minutes here to get started, but thanks for joining. All right, welcome everyone. We'll get started here in about one minute. Thanks for hopping on. All righty, everyone, I will go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the next evolution of MDR, Cyber Risk Reduction, Confidence and Coffee event. My name is Rebecca Bell. I am a channel and field marketing manager here at Critical Start. And today we are joined by our chief technology officer, Randy Watkins and la latte artist, Michael Breach. You'll be able to see some really cool latte art throughout the presentation that's gonna help us tell our story today. Now, before we begin, there's just a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to go over. This session is being recorded and you will receive that recording about 24 hours post event. We'll also be launching polls throughout this presentation. So please feel free to click that answer on there and only click it once. We're in Goldcast today, which is a little different than Zoom what we're used to. So if you look on the right hand side, there's a chat messaging poll Q&A section. And that's really where you'll be living today if you have questions or want to message our speaker or again, answer that poll. So again, feel free to use the chat on the right-hand panel there to make this session as interactive as possible. And you've all been automatically muted, but if you'd like to ask your question live or um, interact with Randy or Michael, please click the raise hand button that's in the Q&A section, and we can go ahead and elevate you onto the stage as a speaker if you have a question for, for Randy or Michael. Otherwise, feel free to put your question in the Q&A or the chat. We'll be monitoring those and make sure we get to those questions. Now we can go ahead and get to the good stuff. I'm going to pass it over to Randy, who will get us started. Thank you, Rebecca, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Randy Watkins. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Critical Start. I've been here for 11 and a half years, so really just kind of getting my feet wet. Uh, and I work on everything from company strategy to working with our channel partners to working with our integration partners uh, like Microsoft, Palo Alto, Sentinel One, CrowdStrike. Uh, and fortunately enough, I continue to work with uh, great customers and prospects like yourselves. So I appreciate everybody joining today. Looking forward to uh, showing you what we've been up to for the last six, eight months or so uh, and seeing some cool latte art. Joining me is the appropriately named Michael Breach. Uh, Michael, why don't you do a, a quick intro for yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm Michael Breach. Yeah, appropriately named for cybersecurity. Um, so yeah, I'm a latte artist. I've been doing latte art for probably around the same amount of time, like 11 years or so, 10 years or so. Um, I started out just working as a barista and then, um, you know, I, I started just kind of branching out, incorporating my own personal like art into the latte art and inventing all of my own techniques. And over time, I ended up just kind of really making a whole career out of it, um, doing lots of you know, television appearances, um, events, and everything like that. So I'm really excited to, uh, you know, share some of these uh, techniques with you today. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Let's uh, mm -hmm. dive in. There we go. Um, so we have a, a, an agenda. It's here. I'm not going to read it. Um, I do have my coffee here. Hopefully you guys have your coffee. If you are on the, the path of the storm, wish you all the best. Uh, please be safe. Uh, we got a couple of uh, folks that are Critical Start family members that are being impacted by it. So I know it's there. I know it's relevant. Um, so please keep you and your family safe and, and keep everybody else in your thoughts and prayers that are in the wake of the storm. 
Um, and we will uh, go ahead and dive into it. Oh, Rebecca said, you know, use the chat, use the, the Q&A. Please do. Uh, this isn't a Gartner briefing. I do like to have conversations with folks. I will try to answer things as we go along. Uh, if we, uh, you know, if I, if I miss one, I'll circle back around at the end. But I do want to make sure everybody gets their questions in uh, and answered. So try to keep it interactive. All right. I think we're going to kick it off with some coffee art. Uh, so, Michael, what are you making first? So we are going to be doing uh, a poker chip appropriately for these uh, next speaking points. I like it. Uh, we, uh, we like to pitch, you know, don't, uh, don't gamble with your, your risk management. Um, so the poker chip is uh, aptly, uh, aptly positioned. Michael, you started this about 11 years ago. What, uh, is there any uh, kind of magic to the, the madness or is it uh, just a lot of practice kind of goofing around and slowly getting better over, over the years? Well, a lot of it, I mean, it's a, I guess all of the above, really. It started out kind of as like a joke. It was, I was getting really good at, you know, lots art and teaching myself how to do it. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where a coworker years ago was like, oh, I bet you can't, you know, draw the chef's face or something. And I was like, all right, because I'm really, you know, I love a challenge. I never like to say that, I never say that I can't do something. Um, I always just say that I haven't done that yet. And that's always sort of been how I've my approach to this. And that's, I think, you know, a lot of a lot of different things. Like, for instance, I didn't even used to use colors. Um, and that is, you know, that that just came from a client. I think I was working. I was actually working with Marvel a few years ago doing these um, in their building. And we were, you know, we were just kind of coming up with cool things for them to post on their social media channels. And they wanted color so you know they asked if i could do it and i'd never really done it before but i just said well let's let's see and then, so i started just you know playing around with you know items that i would you know find at a bakery store because if it's color and it's at a bakery store you can you know most likely eat it so i work with everything edible here so um you know and that's that's just one you know one story of how something happens and you know, certain things can just kind of happen on their own by accident, just from just from experimenting and really, you know, finding out what works and more importantly, what doesn't work. So I have our, our outside of our poker chip here. So I've never even done a poker chip before, but, you know, here we are. Um, so let me ask you, what, what have you found that doesn't work? So certain things that don't work. Um, like I would say, for instance, using a certain type of milk, people were like, oh, can you do this with like almond milk? Can you do this with different materials? And I found that some just don't work um, just due to their whatever, something about their composition or something about their protein content. Um, it just doesn't work. And other things, too, are sometimes like somebody will want. There's a difference between me making a poker chip and me doing a design that's like someone's you know, family vacation photo at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> you know, there's there's going to be a way different level of detail there. And, you know, from that, I learned what I can and can't do as well. Like, I, I kind of have a good, a good feel of what is necessarily possible and what I would have to, like, simplify and change around. And a lot of that's just due to the constraints of the medium itself. And, you know, learning, learning those things is important, but also learning to challenge those things is important too. And that's kind of where this started too, was, you know, 10, 12 years ago, the only latte art you saw were just hearts and, you know, flowers and things like that. So I, I, I wanted to challenge that. I mean, this is looking pretty pokery. Yep. I put it on red. <laughs> Uh, roulette, I see. Let's see. Yeah, I think that's the only, the only, I think the only time I've ever done that was with a, it was a roulette. That's funny. Let's see. All right, we have our, we have our chip. I'm going to circle our little circle a little better here going on here. But, you know, even, you know, every, I mean, a lot of stuff really is just in a way, kind of just creating as you go you know i think that's that's kind of one of my favorite things about this as well um 
you know, just making art in general. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, and, and many times too, like, you know, sometimes a mistake can end up being something that makes something really cool. Like I have, you know, I did one where it kind of went over the edge on, you know, when I was making like a pizza, like, and it kind of went over the edge and I thought, oh, why don't I, why don't I actually make it so the pizza like kind of has a 3D effect and goes over the edge of the cup. And it became one of my most like iconic kind of pieces that I've seen on different, you know, you know, print and, and even on television and stuff like that. Some people will ask, I'll get emails asking if they can use that footage. I believe Bob Ross would call that a happy little accident. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, I like to think of like Bob Ross of Lofty Art. Let's see, we're getting these little designs on the edge here. And yeah, there we go. You know, this would be fun to actually do in Vegas. I could do a whole theme of these, like a roulette wheel. I mean, actually, you know, I did a television show in Vegas uh, that never aired. And that's a whole that's a whole different story, but this that this definitely reminds me of being there. Let's see. And there we have it. We have our poker chip. Beautiful. Great job. Well, let's dive into some of this content. Um, so you you can uh, gamble at the casino, but you don't want to gamble on your security. We're going to take a brief look at kind of the start of security over the over the years. So uh, security kind of goes in ebbs and flows of detection and prevention technology. And you can see as I build out this uh, overlay animated slide here. Um, there we go. But there's a couple of different trends to notice. I mean, antivirus, we start off there where you're reactive. Then we move to, to firewalls, proactive. When I say reactive and proactive, I mean, reactive is uh, waiting for something to happen, then doing something about it. Uh, whether it's letting the file execute and then stopping it or deleting it. And then the proactive model is stopping something from happening in the first place. So we kind of bounce back and forth between the two. And, and it really varies uh, with attacker TTPs. As they evolve, we evolve, and then we operationalize something to the point where we can turn it into proactive control. Then the attacker evolves again, and we go back into reactive. And if you look kind of through this timeline, you notice that we have a really solid stint uh, over the last almost 10 years of really innovating in the reactive space, uh, going from network packet capture and reconstruction to EDR, NDR, MDR, a lot of Ds and Rs. Uh, and those really align to the NIST cybersecurity framework, CSF, under detection and response, uh, go figure, right? And, and when we built, and, and Critical Start was kind of a pioneer of detection and response, MDR, uh, we've been doing it since before it was cool, uh, before it had an acronym, we were going around telling people why we weren't just another MSSP. Uh, it really helped uh, solve a lot of issues that organizations were facing. under resource security teams, constantly evolving TTPs, lack of 24 by 7 coverage, even though a lot of attackers are nation states and they work off hours, uh, and then really in inability to prove effectiveness or to get an ROI from fragmented security tools. And MDR came along to operationalize those and really help augment security staff. And while it did that to some extent, there were a lot of places where we saw traditional MDRs fall short as they started to enter the MDR space. Lack of accountability, no SLAs, lack of transparency, everything was black box. Uh, they really just weren't solving the core problems that organizations needed solved. And unfortunately, I mean, it's been a solid eight years since FDR really started to pick up. There haven't been a lot of folks that have solved these problems. But Critical Start, we've been doing things different since the beginning. So we've always looked at, uh, we've always looked at MDR from a security perspective, not a business perspective. Uh, myself, my, my peers, and, and our CEO, we've been security practitioners and really have felt the pain of legacy MSSPs in the past. So when we started our MDR, uh, you know, black box, accountability, things like that were really what we focused on. So our, our platform is 100% transparent. We're resolving every single alert, regardless of criticality, in an hour or less. And that's a contractual SLA, not an SLO, not a, uh, not a goal of ours. It's contractual, meaning we feel financial pain if we miss that contractual obligation, right? In addition, 
We've also focused on things like resolving every alert, but also our mobile SOC application that allow us to drive down that attacker dwell time. So we're detecting things earlier because we're looking at a lot of the alerts that other MDRs just don't get to. And then we're, we have a flexible interaction platform that allows you to, to really take action as soon as possible. With our mobile SOC, you're turning an 8 p.m. Friday night problem into an 8 a.m. Monday morning problem because you can immediately from your phone use APIs into your existing security investments to isolate that host. We don't require you to install another agent or install another sensor, or give us God mode level on all of your endpoints. We're just using investment that you've already purchased. We're sitting on top of your Microsoft E5 license. We're helping operationalize your Palo Alto Cortex XDR investment. Uh, we're tying into best of breeds like CrowdStrike and Sentinel One. So uh, we really have focused on how do we operationalize your security investment, augment your security team, and drive down that attacker dwell time as efficiently as possible since day one. But again, this is all detection and response oriented if you're kind of CSF minded. And we really needed to move past that towards something that was more risk based. So we're, we're starting to roll out these new capabilities that are really focused on our basic core detection and response offering, but they're outside of detection and response. Doing things like identifying unprotected assets that don't have your EDR agent on them. I'm probably 95% of you on the call, if I asked, hey, do you have your EDR deployed everywhere? It would be a, yeah, I think. I mean, that maybe maybe 98%. But you know who doesn't forget about that 2%? Attackers. That's what they're going to find. That's what they're going to pivot from. We also want to make sure that we're making postural recommendations to improve your security posture, improve your security maturity, and become more resilient to these different attacks. And that's where we tie into MITRE's uh, attack mitigation framework to automatically recommend uh, whether it's policy changes or just procedural uh, practices that you can implement to improve your security posture over time and really mature your environment. We also wanna make sure that you get a return from your SIM. That's probably one of the easiest products to lose money on and really not recognize the value. So we're making recommendations on what sources are you missing and are they all reporting inappropriately, right? How many times has somebody updated their software and now their, their log format is slightly different. They went from host name to host underscore name. Now all your correlation rules are broken. So we wanted to fix that. And then we also wanted to uh, expand the area of expertise that was inside our SOC. So we're growing it into a risk and security operations center. So we can really, again, make those uh, recommendations from a, 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 a kind of a, a position of knowledge and expertise based on the visibility of your environment that improves your security over the long run. It's not just point in time. We don't want the reactive uh, nature of managed detection and response to be your only security plan. So we have a quick poll. Uh, do you need help operationalizing your security investments? This is a little bit Boolean. So, I mean, feel free to expand on this in the chat or uh, in the, the Q&A. Uh, I'm just, you know, what investments are you trying to operationalize? Where have you made investments? Uh, where are future investments coming? I always like seeing what roadmaps look like. And that's how we, we kind of came to uh, almost the same realization uh, as Gartner just about eight months earlier. So Gartner, this is one of their slides they presented at Gartner SRM uh, with their security and risk management conference. If you haven't gone to that, I highly recommend it. Uh, it is a high level conference. Uh, so a lot of C-suite, a lot of VPs, a lot of directors, senior directors, uh, really strong thought leadership presented there. Um, and that's one of my favorite ones to actually sit in the sessions. But they had a long session, Pete Short did, about the future of MDR and how it's historically been reactive and needs to start thinking along the lines of proactive. And I was sitting in the audience like, man, we've been developing this for the last four months. This is fantastic. So they're really speaking our language, calling for the future of MDR to not just be reactive and wait for something to happen, but to be proactive and help improve security posture and prepare for those attacks to come in. And really what I'm here to present is the future. The future of MDR is now. And before I dive into that, we're going to go into some more coffee art. So, Michael, what are you making next? I think you might be muted. I was definitely muted there. So we're gonna be working 
on the wheel. I was trying to spare you from uh, espresso machine noises, which, you know, could be quite interruptive. Um, so I'm going to be using some more color here, and we're going to be working on the uh, risk assessment peer benchmarking or benchmarking right framework alignment. So this is the wheel that you were that I was given before that has, I think, some of the speaking points here. So it's kind of it's kind of similar to the the poker chip, but a lot more colors going on. And I really love using these colors. This is it's a lot of fun actually. So in the what I'm using here in the colors, if anyone is wanting to know, is I just use a bit of gel paste color here. Um, so also, yeah, anyone in the in the chat too, if they want to ask questions, I can always answer those as well. Um, so somebody said they were here from Turkey, which is pretty cool. I've actually done, I did like a, a coffee festival in Turkey once in uh, Istanbul, which was really fun. Yeah, and, and something else that I, I forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, we gave Michael three designs. Uh, this one is going to be uh, almost a foreshadow into the next uh, slide and section of content. Um, we didn't give him a fourth. And if he's got time for it at the end, he can absolutely make one based on your recommendations. So uh, if you have a like, hey, I would love to see this in a, in a latte. Um, I think the last time uh, Michael actually did this for us, uh, he made a Doberman for me that was it was pretty slick. So I'm, I'm uh, happy to hand over the uh, the reins to uh, one of you. And, and uh, best idea, uh, the, the one that looks the most fun for Michael to do is, is what he will do for the last uh, coffee art. Yes, that is definitely, I'm fully open for that. So it can be anything. It could be a portrait of a person. It could be a pet. It could really be anything. You know, obviously I, I can do poker chips. So, I mean, I could <laughs> do a portrait. And in fact, actually the first the first piece I ever did, um, latte art wise, was a portrait. Um, it was just like a random face in a cup and it wasn't it wasn't supposed to be a person it was just like just a rant like anyone in particular it was just a random a random like shadowy face and when i went to put it online it actually triggered the face detection and that that's kind of when my, the light bulb went off to me and i thought oh like this is actually kind of like a cool idea you know i wonder i wonder if anybody does something like this and then um you know i did some research and i saw that nobody did anything like this and there was, you know, it's kind of like what you were saying um, about how you all started. There was not really anybody doing what you did and you were able to sort of, um, you know, pioneer in the field that you're in. And I definitely feel like that's important no matter what you do, even if you just do, you know, something like latte art. I think it's just, you know, because nothing I'm doing really here, there is nothing like there's no set way, you know, there's no like tools you can buy just for this purpose. So everything I do is just kind of, you know, I'm always kind of figuring out something new. Michael, it looks like we, uh, we lost the video. Are you still with us? Well, technical difficulties. What are you going to do? We'll uh, we'll let Michael uh, have a chance to dial back in while he's uh, figuring out the the technical difficulties. We'll go on with the content. I'll show you what he'll eventually have in uh, in coffee uh, with really the future of MDR, and we're calling this managed cyber risk reduction. Uh, and really, we we chose this name. I mean, after a lot of a lot of thought went into it because we wanted to do a more holistic approach to risk reduction rather than just detection and response. So uh, MCRR is really the expansion of MDR beyond just doing detection and response, beyond waiting for something to happen, but really looking at your posture, looking at uh, how your organization looks to attackers and how they would potentially uh, get inside of your organization. Now, there are, are really two different, um, I guess, uh, types of attacks, there's target or uh, types of targets, there's targets of opportunity, and then there's targets of interest. Targets of opportunity is, you know, the thief that's going through the neighborhood and just tapping on all the door handles to see what's what's unlocked. A target of interest, they know what's in your house and they want it. 
And with the right posture, you can stop 99% of those targets of opportunities, those spray and pray attacks, those, you know, kind of internet based, just, um, you know, script kitty attacks. You can get rid of a lot of those with the right posture. Uh, the, the targets of interest, though, those are the low and slow ones, the nation state sponsored, um, you know, they're doing dumpster diving, they're doing recon on your executive team. Uh, they're they're identifying credentials, but they're not using them right away. They're really laying low and slow, uh, playing it out to the ultimate goal, which is, you know, stealing information, destruction of property, massive ransoms, things like that. So where we look at positioning these these different controls is the more proactive controls are stopping those targets of opportunity. But the detection response needs to remain for those targets of interest, the ones where they are really after you and you need somebody that's watching 24 by 7 across all of your different alert signals to identify those attacks and, and respond uh, in kind. Now, here's a little bit of a, a market texture diagram, how everything is playing together. So our platform, which is uh, we've rebranded, it used to be affectionately known as the Zero Trust Analytics platform that was really geared towards managed detection and response. Now, the MDR offering isn't changing at all. We're not diluting it. We're not pivoting away from it. We're just expanding it. We're making it more holistic. We're, we're allowing it to uh, be more proactive and, and really move into the rest of the CSF framework. So we've rebranded that appropriately to uh, the, the core platform, Cyber Operations Risk Reduction. So really, when we, we look at that, uh, it's combining all the signals that we're receiving from your different products. I see Michael is back. So um, he can uh, continue to build out his his art on the side, and you'll see that it's very reminiscent of the uh, the pinwheel from the last one. Uh, but really, what we're doing is we're pulling together all of that signal. Uh, we're tying it together with our own uh, kind of back end, which again is fully transparent. So we still have the trusted behavior registry looking at every single alert that's coming through. We're combining that with a bunch of data analytics from our cyber research unit. Uh, and and uh, a lot of premium threat feeds in addition to some of the uh, uh, kind of formal ISACs that we're bringing in. And then we have our, our risk and security operations center on the other side that's looking at the output from our platform. They're resolving the alerts, they're identifying posture gaps, and they're making recommendations to improve those over time. Now, a lot of benefits come from MCRR. Uh, and, and this really uh, all stemmed from customer feedback, customer conversations, prospect conversations, uh, because they said, hey, you have all of my data, you have all of this expertise, can you do more with it? And we said, well, yeah, I guess we can. And we, we started to do this manually with our, our, uh, our technical account managers and our customer success managers. They're all, uh, they get assigned to different accounts as they come in. So they were manually working with our uh, customers to improve their security posture. We said, we can do more, right? We can build this into the actual platform. So cust customers are empowered to work on these on their own without having to call our CSMs, right? Our CSMs and our TAMs are still there and we're actually growing those teams pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, to to kind of continue the work that we're doing. But we wanted to build it into the platform. So there was never a question of what should I be doing next? Uh, how have I been doing? How am I measuring this? What other improvements can I make in my environment? So there's a lot of benefits that come from an expanded MDR service, somebody that is doing both the proactive and the reactive in unison, and forgive the buzzword, but there's a lot of synergy there. So there's measurable security improvements over time. There's uh, really a, a, a team of folks that are available to you. You're expanding your team on day one by the, you know, 80, 90 different analysts and, and uh, you know, resources that we have available to you. And we understand what needs to be protected, how to protect it. And we have the tools in place to respond appropriately if we need to. And what that really results in is an increase in overall security posture. And we do have a way to measure this, and I will show it off a little bit later, uh, assuming we have the time. That's why I'm talking so quickly. So apologize for blazing through the slides, but I actually do have Figmas and dashboards pulled up that I would much rather review uh, rather than just go through uh, slide overkill. But we are measure measurably improving security posture across CSF as we start to engage with customers and identify uh, you know, where your assets are, what are they, how are they vulnerable? Uh, obviously, detection and response is going to improve uh, more or less, to, regardless of the MDR service you go with. We'd like to think more with us. Uh, but then also on the recover side with our incident response and uh, professional services capabilities. So really, it's measurable impact that we're making 
uh, over time. And then we're benchmarking it against your peers to provide additional guidance on top of it. So when you go into your roadmap development season, uh, so you can prepare for the next year, it's not uh, it's not kind of fluffy finger in the air. Uh, it's really based on hard analytics from your peers as well as the progress that you've made. Now I have a few more slides I want to go through, but it looks like Michael has wrapped up this design, so I want to show it off a little bit. Michael, tell us about the design real quick. So yeah, we have we have the wheel that was given to me with your uh, speaking points on here. Sorry, I dropped out for a second, but you know, glad glad we are all back here. And I don't know, I feel like my computer my screen is like reversed. <laughs> it looks reversed to me, like a mirror image. No, it looks, it looks good. Now, I have to ask, you're putting colors in that coffee. Does it modify the taste at all? No, it doesn't really modify the taste, but it'll definitely like modify uh, the color of your mouth if you drink <laughs> too much of it. Um, yeah, I remember that. I did something once where it was like it, this. It was kind of it was really funny because it was like a show or something. And they they asked um, she asked if she could drink from drink the cup and I think I drew like a it was like the monster from the shape of water it was like a sea monster so it was really bright green and she just went ahead and drank it and her whole mouth turned green and they had to like <laughs> cut the cameras and stuff oh man all right noted no drinking the uh the colored coffee things, yeah certain things you learn <laughs> we were talking about learning things on the field and that's that's definitely one of them so I'll be like no don't touch this one but for the most part, I mean, if I'm not if I'm not going too um, too heavy with it, usually we're fine. But I feel like these are more for our presentation than for you know people drinking. Exactly. Yeah, you can uh, dump those ones out at the end. No need to color anybody's mouth blue and orange. Uh, I'll let you uh, get started on the next one, and we'll we'll finish off these couple of slides. We'll check back in with you in a second. Absolutely. Talk soon. Good stuff. So. Talking about making those recommendations, um, they are real and in the platform and they are backed by the data that we have. Of course, there are some assumptions being made, but uh, I mean, we can we can specify those assumptions when you talk to your CSM and your technical account manager. And all of these are in the platform. So you can kind of look through them and, and uh, kind of cherry pick the ones that may be lower hanging fruit for your organization. So these are true risk ranked uh, reduction recommendations. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Um, but it helps you align your, your security investment to your organization's risk tolerance. I mean, that's what this is all about is, uh, you know, how, how does business and security align to really operationalize the security investment, make sure it's going to the right places. And I'm sure we've all heard the horror stories about buying a product that turned into shelfware or organization priorities changed at the last minute, or there wasn't the uh, kind of political pull to properly implement and it got rejected by a handful of system owners. Uh, I mean, we want to make these recommendations up front so they can be socialized, they can be greenlit, uh, and then they can be put in place and really uh, help close that gap of, uh, you know, what, what the attacker has access to, to to get inside of your environment, all the while using peer data to help justify these, these uh, different investments. So there really is quite a bit of a uh, thought process that went behind these um, some of them are more automated. Some of them have uh, kind of more empirical data behind it. Some of them are almost anecdotal based on what our technical account managers are seeing in your platform. Um, but we are putting uh, some level of metrics and numbers behind it to really help quantify why we're making those recommendations, put them in an order that makes sense, uh, and then enable you to make those changes inside of your environment. We will obviously help where we have uh, some level of influence over those. So if it's a policy change inside of your EDR platform, or if it's missing uh, sources going into your SIM, uh, we definitely want to make sure that we're we're helping you operationalize those uh, and really close those gaps down a little bit more. We have another break for uh, coffee art. So I will pivot back to Michael. What, Michael, what are you making for us now? So we are doing a, a critical start uh, logo and tagline. So it was the tagline, and I'm just going to kind of put it all in here, see, you know, how many letters I can fit in this cup. <laughs> that's always a that's always a fun challenge too. So we have it. Look at that. Sometimes I do these, and it goes right to the edge, and it's just like perfect. And 
I'm like, yes, this looks great. And we're, we're just going with your tagline here. Um, don't, don't fear risk, manage it. That's awesome. What are you using to, uh, to write it on there? I mean, obviously you're, you're dipping it like a quill inside of the, the food coloring, but what is that little bamboo straw thing you have there? These, I mean, I feel like you can get these anywhere. And this is actually what I first started using were these little uh, sticks at this. It was like, like the, you know, the place where I was working at the time. Um, they do make tools for loft hair, stuff like this. You'll see these on, on Amazon and other websites like that. And there's full kits, but I actually don't even use these a lot because I feel like your finger like digs into them and they're not sharp enough. But what I like about these, these are kind of like my secret weapon. Um, it's that they, I can cut them to different like shapes and, um, they hold color in such a way where like I can, I can actually get it to where it holds it just enough so I can use it just to do some like light shading or I can just go really heavy with it. And what I really love about this too, is you can see that this, it's just very like the amount of like how deep the color gets is really, really dependent on the kind of pressure that I put in. So it's very, very like tactile. It's very, it's a very like um, hands-on kind of medium. It's not like a marker where you just kind of draw and it's, you know, one line. So I'd say it's, you know, similar to like a string instrument, I guess. Let's see. Notice, notice the guitars behind you. So I, I was thinking about that. It's kind of similar to that where, you know, just little nuances in your fingers can really, um, you know, have a big impact. Well, let's do this in the spirit of, uh, in the spirit of latte art. Um, the first 10 of you that are on this, this webinar, try your own latte art, make a cup of coffee, froth some milk, pour it on top, try to draw on your own designs, make something cool. The first 10 that submit latte art we're going to send you guys uh, some Don't Fear Risk Manage It t-shirts. Uh, and and uh, the, the best one out there will include a, uh, a tumbler or some, some sort of gift to go with it. So make your own latte art, try it out, um, use some different colors, and uh, uh, yeah, submit it to us. Send it to uh, uh, Rebecca. Can you drop an email address uh, in, the, uh, in the chat that they can submit it to? And then, uh, yeah, the first 10 that submit, we'll send you a T-shirt. The best one we get, we'll send a T-shirt and an extra little uh, extra little gift. That's that's a brilliant idea. It's like, um, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Just I could, I would love to see. I would love if you all sent me those too. <laughs> Show me what those are. And yeah, you, we'll, um, we'll forward them to you. Yeah, and you could totally do that using this these materials that I had. I used this stuff. Um, if you, you know, whatever you feel like too. I think you could probably use chocolate sauce or something like that too. But I use this and I just use these little skewer things or just, you might have a toothpick or something at home. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the a good color for this too is look for like chocolate brown. That's like, that's one that I like to use for, you know, just for something that matches coffee. And if we did have time, I could do, I could do that fourth one we were chatting about. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely have a couple of minutes left at the end. Um, so also drop your um, drop your suggestions into the chat right now, and and Michael can pick one. And uh, while we're going through, uh, I believe I, I got through all the slides actually. Yes, I did. Yes, I got through the slides, so we can go onto the 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 portal into the Figmas uh, and actually look at some of the features that we're baking in. Um, you don't have to have the art supplies yet. You just have to have coffee supplies. Uh, yeah. Just you know, get your get your coffee, get a little bit of foam on top of it there, get your uh, your colors and, and kind of sketch on top. Uh, I think milk frothers are like 10 bucks on Amazon. I get you a toothpick and some food coloring. Uh, but submit uh, somebody submit a suggestion for Michael to draw on top of the uh, the last cup of coffee. And while I'm working through the uh, the dashboards and showing you guys some really cool stuff, uh, he can make something else that uh, that looks awesome on top of a cup of coffee. We saw Oppenheimer face. I don't know. I could do, I could I could really do whatever you want. How about Kermit the Frog? Kermit the Frog? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's a that's a good suggestion. All right, we'll take that one. I just love the randomness of that. Um, that's so great. I'm looking up a picture right now for reference and we're gonna do it. We're gonna make Kermit the Frog. Perfect. 
Yeah, we're going to do Kermit the Frog, not the Randy Watkins face. Uh, thanks, Gabe. I appreciate it, but uh, we'll, we'll give that one a, uh, a hearty thumbs down. Uh, so I, I want to walk you guys through some of the... Let me change this layout back so you can see this better. Uh, I want to walk you guys through uh, some of what we're releasing and, and what's going to be part of managed cyber risk reduction. So I'll start off looking at the integrations. Historically, our TAMS and our, our onboarding and implementation engineering team has made all of the integrations, but we're expanding our integrations beyond what we're monitoring and really into what we can collect additional information from. So as part of that, we're making that all self-service. Great, super cool. But what's really cool is how we're going to use that data. And I'm gonna start off showing you asset visibility. So and, uh, EDR is by far the most valuable signal for MDR providers. Uh, it's the best place for detection. It's the best place for investigation. It's the best place for response. A lot of times it encompasses network data. So it really is something that we want to make sure we have full coverage on. And I talked a little bit earlier about this. When we, when we look at what full coverage actually is, uh, a lot of times people say, yeah, I have full coverage, but it's, it's kind of scored the same way as full employment. Like, oh, we assume that there's going to be three to 5% that just not there. Uh, and that assumption is, is dangerous and that's risk and that's gambling with risk. And we want to remove as much of that as possible. So what we're going to be doing is taking uh, uh, lists of your assets from different products, like your vulnerability management platform, like your uh, EDR platform, like your uh, patch management platform, your backup platform. Uh, we're going to take lists of those assets. We're going to start off by deduping. Right, there's a lot of overlap there. So we'll dedupe them down to total unique hosts. Then we're gonna OS profile it. Let's make sure it can actually hold an EDR agent. If it's Windows embedded, probably not gonna work. If it's Windows, Linux, or Mac full version, absolutely it should have an EDR agent. Then we'll show you how that breaks down and most importantly, where it's missing, including what percent. So really giving you that visibility and enabling you to identify those assets that are sitting off in the corner and they're in a closet, they're covered in dust, nobody's patched them, they're just sitting back there, they missed the, the CrowdStrike deployment, whatever it is. And we'll enable you to properly cover your entire environment with EDR, or at the very least discover some assets that need to be removed from the environment. Now, what are those assets? Glad you asked. We come in here, we choose endpoint security gaps. We also will identify backup agent gaps uh, in, in the actual releases, we'll also identify patch management gaps, uh, vulnerability management gaps if you're using agents for that. Um, but we're going to identify those gaps and then we'll show you where no coverage exists. So when we do that, it, it'll kind of flag all of those different assets. You'll be able to act on those and escalate those to the proper system owner. And we're also going to give you the uh, how that uh, how that asset exists in the different platforms. So again, I mean, there's always discrepancies between host name being file dash server, domain slash file dash server. Uh, we'll show you the operating system that we pulled it as, max IPs, last scenes, et cetera. So it's not like, well, hey, that machine is, you know, 10 months old and it's not going to have an agent on it. No, no, no. It, it should have an agent because it just checked in a day ago. So we're providing a lot of really valuable uh, information along with the host visibility. The other thing that we're doing is pulling in tiers. And it's not just uh, tiers in criticality as in is a critical Boolean, you know, yes or no. We're looking at multiple tiers. So we're, we're following a model that will identify whether it's a, um, you know, a, a critical kind of core network asset, is it an Active Directory server? We'll allow you to really customize what level of criticality that is. And you can use that throughout the service offerings. So if you want to look at um, like, hey, don't don't isolate any of the hosts that are tier zero or tier one, you can dictate that all right now, but it has to be very granular. It has to be don't isolate these IP addresses or these host names or host names that follow these schemas or this IP range or this subnet. Well, now you'll just be able to say, don't isolate anything tier zero, one or two. Anything after that, you can isolate at will. And you can really dictate and customize those rules of engagement based on everything, including asset criticality. So this is a, a lot of visibility uh, and there will be uh, kind of multiple versions of this, obviously, but um, really it's, it's enabling us to be more effective and impactful at detection and response because we can ensure full visibility uh, with the signal that matters most to us in our SOC. Moving on, vulnerability management is something that it seems like everybody struggles with. 
Uh, and, and it's multiple reasons. I mean, I, I ran uh, vulnerability management at a Fortune 500 insurance company, uh, and it was a constant struggle of having 200,000 vulnerabilities and then begging the system owners to patch it and then getting a whole bunch of rebuttals uh, because they I didn't know what applications were on it. And, uh, this server couldn't be rebooted. I mean, it was uh, it was a, a, just really a pain. Uh, and there's a lot of political capital that goes into forcing patching. And, and I would love to say that that doesn't exist. And maybe in your organization, it doesn't. If it doesn't, kudos to you. Uh, but for a lot of other organizations, it absolutely does. And I know because I was there. Um, and really what I wanted was somebody that could help me prioritize them. And I know a lot of organizations that manually recast their risks and recast their vulnerabilities. And that is awful. That is a very painful thing to do. So what we've done is we've created our VPE. We're a security company. We have to make a handful of acronyms. Otherwise, we get kicked off the list. So we created VPE, the Vulnerability Prioritization Engine. And what we're doing is we're taking your, uh, your vulnerabilities from Tenable, Microsoft, Qualys. Uh, we'll build out you know, all of them. We're not going to support the open VAS or anything like that. We're not building in our own kind of weak open source scanner. We're going to use best of breed products because that's what we do. Uh, we bring in the total vulnerabilities. We look at their CVSS severity. Then we go through the individual score. Then we run it through our VPE and we recast it. Now, how do we recast it? Glad you asked. We look at exposure. So I had a great conversation with a Gartner analyst on risk versus exposure. And, and the, the agreement that we came down to is risk is the totality of everything an attacker could go after. And exposure is what they're going after right now. That, that is uh, open in your environment. And really what that comes down to, if you think about the, the risk formula is impact and probability. Um, the exposure really speaks more to the probability uh, and, and then you have the impact on top of it. So we're really looking at the factors that influence exposure, uh, AKA the impact of it hit or the, the probability of it hitting you. So when we turn on our risk-based prioritization, we look at CVSS, sure. We look at affected assets, great. We can also pull in the uh, asset criticality, like I talked about earlier, and then we can look at, is it weaponized? Super valuable. If it's not weaponized, then, I mean, the risk drops substantially of it being used against you. Unless it's a true zero day and an actual nation state has developed a, an exploit that nobody else has picked up on yet, there's a possibility it could happen, but this is the data that we have to work with. We look at the exploit code maturity. Um, you know, is it broadly available? Is it only being used by researchers? Is it on pace bin? Uh, then we're looking at who uh, who it's targeting. So what industries is this going after? Is it medical? Is it healthcare? It, or I guess those are the same. Is it manufacturing? Um, you know, what is it? Is it telecom? Then we're looking at who's using it. APT groups, ransomware families, botnets, CNCs. How many exploits are available? When was it first exploited and how many days did it take to exploit? And that gives you a lot of information on, hey, any script kitty can can you know weaponize this against us. Um, so, you know, one exploit being out, this isn't the beginning, right? If it only took two days to develop an exploit against, it's going to there's going to be multiple exploits coming out very, very quickly. So a lot of information on here that we use to help recast um, the severity uh, of the different vulnerabilities. So when you go to your systems owner, and you say, you need to patch this box. You can say, please patch this box, this vulnerability. We have three APT groups that are using this against our vertical, and it was just released yesterday. So there's a lot more empirical data you can use to really back up um, what, you're, what you're requesting and, and really kind of uh, uh, support your, your request uh, and, and help you kind of justify uh, the push for that to be put, uh, uh, patched. The last uh, kind of new module, we'll call it, <laughs> that we're offering, the, the Miss Piggy gift got me. Uh, the, the last module that we're, uh, that we're uh, pushing out there is a way to measure your improvements over time. And I'm really, really excited about this one. Our PM team did a great job at developing it. We start off with templates and we're building out more templates, but right out of the box, we have ISO, we got CIS, we got SOC2, CSF, uh, different revs of NIST. Um, then we have a couple of custom assessments up top. The quick start assessment, 15 questions, crosswalks to 60% of NIST CSF. Now stay tuned because we're debating on releasing this to just our customers or just to the general public and let you do the, the quick start assessment 
regardless if you buy into our entire solution, our MDR or nothing. Um, the NIST CSF guided assessment is one that I'm really excited about because what we did was we took this CSF and we overlaid it with CMMI. So now it's no longer a Boolean of do you have this control, yes or no, but it's how operationalized is this control in your environment? And that is magic right there because now you're able to say we have this, but we need to put some more effort and resources into really developing policy and procedure around how we're going to use this. And most importantly, what do we do once we have it in place with policy and procedure wrapped around it? So it's really a way to measure overall maturity. Now, when we take a look at how that manifests, uh, you get a couple of different radar charts up here. You get some uh, comparison charts. You also get this prioritized risk assessment improvements where we'll show you where you may be dragging behind some of your peers. And if you wanna go into this a little bit uh, more closely, you can look at these modules, you can break these from functions into categories. You can also review the results against your peers and see where you may be falling behind uh, in very kind of granular fashion on the individual controls that make up NIST CSF. And we chose NIST CSF because in a poll across our existing customers, 95% were aligning to it, um, you know, either fully or partially. So that's why we picked NIST CSF to really dive into. And I've reviewed the framework. I've, I've done, uh, you know, kind of RFC. Um, there, it's a, a really solid framework uh, to, to base your, your security posture on. The other thing you can do is measure your progress. So if we swap this to the last, uh, last assessment, so now we're looking at December 22 versus June 23, you can show your C-suite, you can show your board, you can show whoever needs to see it, the massive improvements that you've made since last year. Oh, people that need to see it, your cyber insurance company, turn this over to them, right? You can export this. So if you go into um, your assessments, you can actually export these into a, 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 a PDF, an XLSX, a, a PowerPoint. You can export your assessments and turn these right over to your, your, uh, your cyber insurance broker. Now, in addition to just filling it out like a CMMI model, you can also append evidence. So you can take screenshots, you can upload reports. It's a really, really powerful tool to help you justify lowering down those premiums or getting approved for cyber insurance at all. So awesome module. I uh, wish I would have had this when I was on the practitioner side, but now it's baked into the platform. And when you combine that with the MDR capabilities, this is what you get. So this is our new cyber risk dashboard, combines all the modules in addition to pulling in like the Microsoft Secure Score from the Microsoft console using APIs. You also see down here, the SIM log health monitoring showing, hey, there's errors because this, this feed got updated. Uh, you know, your network admin closed down a firewall rule that allowed this traffic to get to your log forwarder. But we're combining all the visibility from every module that, that we're, we have for you here in one place. We're also doing those MITRE attack mitigation recommendations. So if we see 37 alerts come in for M1018, we break it down. We see 16 of them coming in for 1078. You can click on this to pivot directly to the alerts. And you can also see what mitigation uh, techniques we're recommending based on where those alerts are falling. That's automatic based on just the visibility from the MDR. Now, if we pull back again, this is our risk ranked reduction recommendations. And you can see this is pulling not just from MDR, but also from the quick start assessment, from the endpoint security control gap, from SIM monitoring controls gap. If you have the vulnerability management piece, it'll tie into that as well. But we're really making our recommendations based on risk, so probability times impact, the effort to implement, and this is our um, kind of prediction or assumption based on, are you going to have to procure new products? Is this a policy change? Is it a change to an existing product? Uh, and then you can look at your current level based on this CSF. You can look at your post implementation level, and then you can look at where your peers are. So really this is the roadmap. This is where you start picking the fruit off the trees. This is uh, kind of a really prescriptive way to improve not just your uh, security architecture, not just to buy more products, but really measurably improve your security readiness, your security posture, your security maturity, and your resilience to those targets of opportunity. Uh, and then our ability to look at those targets of interest, again, looking at the endpoint security controls gaps uh, and looking at where you may be missing very common controls that prevent those kinds of things like MFA. So that's all I wanted to show you today. 
Uh, I know I went through a lot of information very quickly. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Feel free to put them in the Q&A. Feel free to reach out for an additional conversation. I'm pretty easily available. Randy at criticalstart.com. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, you can shoot me an email. I'm happy to talk more in depth about anything from the product release to um, you know just security in general. I'm a nerd. I'm a technologist, just like everybody on here. So we really do thank you for your time. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this. Again, don't forget to submit your latte art. I want to see it. We will send you t-shirts. And for uh, whoever does the best, we will send you a, another special gift uh, that I will uh, tell marketing about later. We'll figure that one out. I, I kind of just offered this mid-flight. So with that, again, thank you. I'm going to uh, share the screen again back to Michael so he can show us his Kermit the Frog. Oh, yeah. Check it out. We have a Kermit the Frog. And I had some extra time, so I went into some, like, details here. You know, I added some, like, shading and some highlights. You could really, you know, just there's a lot you can do. You can outline it. There's, so you can go from really simple to really complex. And it's kind of cool. Like, sometimes I don't really know where to stop. You could just keep adding things if you want. And I kind of I kind of added the arms just sort of like he's, you know, cheering cheering us on, you know. <laughs> no, I, I'm one of the, the kind of the earlier – founding members of Critical Start. And I love everything you do with our logo and our messaging and the poker chip and all that stuff's cool. Kermit the Frog blows everything else out of the water. That is fantastic. Yeah, that yeah. looks 3D. Yeah. Miss Piggy would be proud. Thanks so much. You know, I probably could have done a 3D actually made his little pot, like his hands coming out of the cup or something. That is awesome. That looks great. Thanks, Michael, for uh, for being on with us. Thanks for doing the art. Looks really good. Um, super interesting. So thank you for... Uh, for being our entertainment for the hour. Yeah, thank you so much as well. I mean, thanks for having me. I, you know, I love doing these and I really appreciate it. Awesome. Again, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions uh, or if you'd like uh, to have additional conversations. Uh, aside from that, uh, if you're in the, the path of the hurricane, I think I saw uh, uh, somebody earlier, Mark, Mark, stay safe. Um, you know, if you're in an evacuation zone, get out of there. I know it's a it's a king tide in addition to the hurricane blowing in. So um, do stay safe. Take care, everybody, and uh, have a great week.